I'm here to talk to you for the next 10 minutes around uh, our, our relationship with our technology. My background, I originally uh, began my career as a psychologist and a neuroscientist. So I spent about many, many years, about 14 years studying the brain, and then I decided to change careers and I went into leadership. In fact, I went to Royal Roads and got, went through the Masters of Leadership program. And when I left uh, my science background, my science career, my parents were, were aghast and they said, well, what, what in the world does leadership have to do with, bra with the brain? I don't see the connection. And I guess I didn't see the connection either, but as I started to work as a consultant and an educator in leadership, one of the things I noticed going into organizations is people's ability to focus, I noticed, is diminishing. And I noticed as how can we be good leaders if we can't even be in the moment and to focus. So in that, I started to go back to my brain science and I sort of discovered some interesting research that's just cropped up recently. And I want to share that with you today. And that information is, what is our devices not just doing to our, our habits or behaviors, but there's actually some profound research that, uh, suggesting that it's rewiring and fundamentally changing our brains. In fact, some people have said that our engagement with our devices has the same impact when human beings first started using language and, and a written alphabet had such a dramatic rewiring of the brain. So I want to share with you some of that research. Now, there are some trends that we're seeing, and I want to share those with you. Over the last, last five, six, eight years, if you look at uh, the research, we see that humans are spending less and less time in the presence of other humans. We're spending more time communicating through our devices, which may not be a surprise to you. What we're noticing is people's concentration is going down, down, down. When I first started to look at this, uh, the, the research was saying the average uh, person at work could, could focus about seven minutes on a task without having the need to interrupt themselves or distract themselves, typically by checking their email or going online. Now, the recent stats I've seen is down to three minutes. Now, the average person can't go three minutes without having to check their devices. And the other thing we're seeing is psychological issues like depression, anxiety disorders, obsessive compulsive disorders. We're seeing those go up and we're seeing a connection to people who are experiencing more of this also are heavy device users. And I'll share some of that research with you as well. So I want to first focus on one aspect that what technology is doing to us. And I think it's, we all know this, it's around distraction. Now, uh, Dr. Hallowell uh, is, a, is a psychiatrist who in the late 90s started seeing adults come into his clinic who were demonstrating what looked like ad, uh, attention deficit disorder that you typically diagnose in children. Now, what was strange is you normally never see it in an adult unless you've been diagnosed as a child. He was finding that these people coming in did not have a history of being diagnosed as children. So he started to investigate a little closely what these people were doing and he found there's something unique about the way they worked. And what do you think that is? Multitasking. Multitasking. multitasking, exactly. He found that the more they multitask, the more they show these symptoms. So he's actually created now a psychiatric diagnostic tool called attention De deficit trait. And part of those things that they look at is your ability to focus your attention. Uh, um, how irritated or, or agitated you get when you're not around your, your technology. Uh, how well do you interact with people in terms of listening or how, you know, interrupting. And all these things he's sort of compiled together and has now a way to sort of diagnose people with this. Now, multitasking, if you ask most people, people think that's a good thing. In fact, if you look at the typical job application, you'll see that multitasking is an asset. And I would suggest that uh, we can't actually multitask. The brain science is very clear on this. As humans, we can't actually do two things simultaneously at once. We actually have to alternate back and forth, but we can do it very quickly. Now, there's been hundreds and hundreds of studies that looked at multitasking, and most of them, 99%, show that when you multitask, your, your level of performance goes down than if you were to do one task at a time. We're talking hundreds of studies. In fact, we've actually worked out. So if you're deeply immersed in one task, let's say you're very focused, and you get interrupted for one minute, 
it takes you 15 minutes to regain the same level of concentration that you had before the interruption. So you start to see how that becomes very inefficient. You don't get as much depth in terms of your concentration when you're trying to do multiple things at the same time. The estimates are about 40%. Uh, you lose about 40% efficiencies when you try to do two things at once versus if you did one thing at, by itself. In fact, this is such a serious issue that the IT sector about, about four years ago identified this as a crisis. They actually formed a nonprofit group, so we're talking Google, Intel, Microsoft. They banded together, created something called the Information Overload Research Group, and they throw money at anybody, academic researchers, corporate anyone who can research and find solutions to help their workforce focus better because they're noticing their focus is going down. Now I want to talk about what's happening in the brain. Why is multitasking not only inefficient, but I'm going to make the case further that it's actually damaging your brain. Now if you think about it, when we evolved, when human beings 200,000 years ago first appeared on the planet, most of our existence was walking around a fairly constant environment. The only time we had to focus on two things at once was, A, there's something, I think, trying to eat me. I've got to focus and, and try and maintain my attention on this. Or there's a food source there. I need to go after it. Right? So our brains weren't designed, they didn't evolve to actually do this on a regular basis. They only were designed to do it in a moment of importance or crisis. Now, when you multitask, what happens is you release stress, stress hormones in your system, which actually damage the brain. And there's uh, studies have shown that 30 days of continuous stress, you can start seeing parts of your brain that deteriorate. Now there's a study that was just published in September uh, at the University of Sussex in the UK, and I have the reference there. And in there, they actually looked at multitaskers and they, they looked at how much people multitask in terms of switch between devices, so they'd ask, you know, when you watch TV, how often do you check your phone or check the internet while you're doing multiple things? And then they took these people in and they imaged their brains. And what they found was the more people multitask, they had certain parts of the brain that actually were shriveling up and, and deteriorating, less cortical thickness. And one area in particular, in the prefrontal cortex, which is right behind your eyeballs, an area called the anterior cingulate cortex, which is important for uh, regulating emotions, empathy, social skills, that area was thinning the most dramatically. The other aspect is around addiction. <laughs> Canadians are one of the highest users in the world of devices and internet. We rank one of the highest. The average Canadian right now in every second sends 2,500 text messages. That's about a text message every seven minutes. About 56% of uh, young people check their phones uh, on average every 15 minutes. Uh, older generations, about, about 34% based on Larry Ro Ro Rosen's research. So what is addiction? And so if you look at any classic uh, criteria or addiction, you see that our use with our devices follows that. In fact, last year, the diagnostic statistical manual that catalogs all psychiatric disorders that psychologists, psychiatrists use, they finally recognized internet disorder as a true psychological disorder. And here are the characteristics of it. You can see compulsive to seek out activity, loss of control, you can't control yourself, and a lot of negative emotions associated with that. Now, uh, in Particularly in Asia, Korea in particular, and China, they have, we know that they have a higher incident. About the average North American, about 19% of North Americans fall under the criteria of having this order. So one out of five people already meet that. In Korea, it's a bit higher. It's almost 40% uh, of the population. In the studies they've been doing there, they've been doing a lot of brain uh, studies on people that have been diagnosed with, with this disorder. Again, they're seeing areas of the brain that thin out. So this is a picture of the colored areas are areas that are actually diminishing, shrinking up, particularly the prefrontal cortex area. Again, the area important for regulating our behavior, our emotional, rational thought. So to conclude, I don't want to leave you on a bummer. So I think there's two things you can do. By the way, you have 15 minutes still, so don't panic with that voice. You're, you're okay. Two things that I'd like to offer you that you can do that I think will help, help you. Number one is containment. So containment, I mean, is 
Limit your time with technology. Be mindful about it. Don't be mindless. Now, the research that I've come across, they say you should have at least four hour breaks on an average day. You should go four hours without going to any device to stay in a healthy psychological state. They say the, ha the happy, safe way to uh, amount of times to check emails about four times a day. Right now, the average Canadian checks 27 times a day. The other thing is, I don't know if you've heard of it, it's a new fad called monotasking. It's been around for hundreds of thousands of years. And that is, just choose to do one thing at once. Shut down all your other applications on your, on your, on your laptop or your computer and just look at one thing. I only check email twice a day and I have set times when I do it. And people start to know that and I get less email because of it. By the way, every hundred people that get CC'd on an email that they shouldn't get CC'd on takes up eight hours of a person's day at work human work hours, just to give you the significance of the loss of productivity. And finally, sustainment, uh, substituting high quality stimulation instead of low quality. I often say your brain is a lot like your stomach. Your stomach doesn't care what you put into it. You could put junk food into it. It just wants stuff in it. it turns out your brain's similar. It just wants to be stimulated. And by stimulation, uh, it doesn't really care if it's, it's high glossy stimulation or high quality. So switching to high quality stimulation, such as like reading a book is found to be much more quality stimulation for your brain than reading something off even a screen. And finally, mindfulness practice, which is basically the ability to practice to be in the moment. And just to leave you with some research shows that people who practice mindfulness actually thicken up their prefrontal uh, cortex. The area that we see diminished with technology, you can actually reverse by practicing by being more in the moment. So I'll leave you with a quote from Einstein. He says, I fear the day that technology will surpass the human interaction. The world will have a generation of idiots. Thank you very much.